In 2013, the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service entered into a cooperative agreement with the South Dakota No-Till Association and IGRO, SDSU Extension, for delivering the latest soil health and productivity technology to South Dakota farmers and ranchers. This event was held in Mitchell. Actually, did you hear what Ray says? Uh, he says three mics is about right for me. Actually, here's, here's the first one, and they gave me two more. I look at it and I said, hey, I know we like guns in South Dakota, but I don't think guns, I need guns here. So. You're coming too good now. I know. Uh, am I coming good? Maybe. I, yeah. I think. All right. Let's see how it goes, guys. All right. Uh, I actually spent a lot of time in South Dakota. And what I'm going to do, OK, now I can even hear myself. So I must be doing something right. Let's see how it goes. Uh, here is one of the reasons why I like to come to South Dakota. You guys have some of the best fishing. So uh, uh, here's the question. My last name is actually Knezovic. It's not a silent K, it's a true K. It's Knezovic. It's one of those funny uh, Slavic, Slavic last names. So um, I actually uh, spent a lot of time in South Dakota. I'm not kidding. I wasn't kidding when I said that earlier. Is anybody here from Yankton County or somewhere down south? There's a couple of guys. Oh, I have, uh, if you guys know where English Height is, just north of the lake, uh, that's where I have a cabin. So that's my playground. South Dakota is my playground. So anyway, all right. So here's the question. I sent this picture out to a couple of my buddies. You know, uh, and they told me this was like uh, one of those Photoshop deals, you know. And I said, you know how when you have friends and they give you a hard time. And I said, wait a minute, is this a Photoshop? And they said, oh, maybe we'll believe you now. So the question is, if you guys tell me what kind of fish is this, you are going to get a Nebraska weed guide. It's a $15. You can buy this book on uh, UNL Marketplace. So if you type in on your Google, unlmarketplace.com, it'll take you into uh, University of Nebraska Extension Publications. And you get this book. Uh, it's about 300 uh, and some pages. And uh, if you guys tell me what's the name of that fish, I'm going to give a few books out free. OK, somebody said tuna. Somebody said? Yellowfin tuna. I knew people were going to say that. I mean, you look at the, uh, the yellow color of that tail. You know, that's giveaway, but it's actually not, it not tuna. Keep going. Did somebody else say something? No, no. Well, come on. You guys don't know jack about fishing, do you? Huh? Actually, I just gave you a clue. <coughs> yeah, it is a yellowtail jack. That's what it is. So anyway, but at least I'll just have to give only one book away. <laughs> Sorry. What about this one? This one is easy. Everybody's going to know this one. <coughs> OK, raise your hand. Who said Calvert? <coughs> one. Don't be shy. Come on, don't be shy. I'm not easy going. We're from Nebraska, you know? Just next door. Oh, you caught one. That's there. You are. I like them. Uh, I won't tell you where we did all that fishing. Okay, so I'm gonna leave one book for me, and then I'll uh, I'll give that one out away later. So who was? There was a fe fellow here, another fellow here. Okay, was that? Okay, you. Uh, on the end of my presentation, come to me, and I'll give you the one that's left. I want to use that throughout my talk a couple of times here. So, all right. Uh, I actually live in uh, Wayne, Nebraska, which is about uh, 70 miles south of Yankton, of Yankton. So we do have a little bit different accent in Wayne. You know, we talk a little funny, you know. But they tell me people talk funny in South Dakota too. So hopefully we'll get along just fine. Hopefully we'll get along just fine. So let's let's get the ball rolling. Actually, you guys have my complete presentation in your handouts, so you can go through and. You know, maybe uh, you can study that or whatever and then ask me some questions. So, so I'm going to give you a, a pretty good overview of what's going on now in the world of weed science, world of weed science. And uh, 
basically, with introduction of Roundup Ready crops, um, you know, we've been uh, we've been using Roundup. Uh, I don't even know which term should I use. We've been using it extensively. We've been using it too much. Uh, it works well, and then we fall in love with it, and we just keep using it way too much. And then uh, it all worked great for about you know 15 years or so, and now we're beginning to see. Uh, see problems and we're going to see more problems until we start uh, uh, changing our, uh, our uh, weed, uh, weed control program. So basically what this slide is saying that you know, we spent about close to 15 years, although I say their decade, you know, using Roundup uh, all the time. And when Roundup Pretty Corn came on board in 2007 or so, uh, we started using uh, literally you know, way, way too much Roundup in both, uh, in both crops. And then before introduction uh, of Roundup Ready crops, there were three weed species resistance to Roundup. Now we had about 35 worldwide, uh, as you can see on this map. And some of these things I'm just going to uh, walk through relatively uh, fast just to give you a, a snapshot of what's going on. If you look across the United States, we have about 16, 16 different weed species that develop resistance, resistance to Roundup. So uh, anyway, on this slide, I ran out of space, so I just listed only 12. Uh, these are some maps of what's been going on over the, over the years. Uh, this is the resistance across the country uh, uh, you know, in 2007. Uh, you can see the list of, list of species there. Here we are now in 2012, and it says here on the bottom, if you don't have it now, uh, you, know, you may have it soon. Uh, we do have, we're all guilty of thinking like, oh, it's not going to happen on my farm, you know, and if it happens my neighbor farm, and then uh, especially if I don't like the neighbor, I may think, oh, that's what he deserved, or maybe not. But anyway, and uh, uh, basically, uh, basically uh, things are not going to uh, get better. So if we look locally here, you know, these are the weed species that we uh, determine. I'm actually one of the five weed scientists in Nebraska. I cover the eastern part of the state. And then uh, we hired a couple of younger fellows now. So I'm the oldest guy in the system, so they keep dragging me now all over. Last year, I gave uh, 46 presentations across Nebraska on different topics. I actually do quite a bit of research on uh, organic and non-chemical weed control. Uh, using uh, machines like flaming, we design a machine for flaming weeds using propane, which costs about 10 gallons, which is about 10 bucks an acre to a one, do a one shot. One shot. A lot of organic uh, producers in Nebraska, and I've been up through uh, some parts of South Dakota talking about organic uh, weed control and and so forth. But anyway, so you know, these are the species. Uh, these are the species that uh, that we know or we confirmed um, uh, resistant to. Uh, uh, different types of chemistries, and as you can see, uh, there's five of them that, uh, you know, are, or six of them that round up, uh, that round up, or any of the glyphosate-based products, uh, they don't really, uh, they don't really control it anymore on the label, on the label rate. And speaking of the label rate, it seems to me uh, uh, nobody's really using label rate anymore, especially with the generic roundup. So if you can get a generic glyphosate for 10 bucks a gallon, and they'll just use the two quarts instead of one quart. And some guys may just use all four quarts. Believe me, I've seen all kinds of stories out there. And uh, so I'm going to walk you through uh, three, uh, three different uh, species here. I'll talk about water hemp. I'll talk about uh, giant ragweed and meristail. Also, uh, when you checked, when you signed in, uh, you should have received uh, uh, a bunch of articles from Nebraska crop protection clinics. We do uh, crop protection clinics across the state in the first uh, three weeks of January. Uh, this year, uh, we covered, uh, we've been at nine different locations, and we had anywhere from uh, um, 150 to 350 uh, people. We uh, hit more than 3,000 people across the state of Nebraska through our crop protection clinic. So what I, what I emailed to uh, Root was uh, about five or six different uh, articles that we've written about the details of the chemicals for this. So I'm not going to spend too much time on telling you go with the chemical A versus chemical B. You can, uh, you can read uh, all that out in those articles. And then also, also in the weed guide, in our Nebraska weed guide, we actually sell about 18,000 copies of this uh, uh, some years. I think this year, I don't know what we're going to have. 
out, but we do have a herbicide's efficacy tables, and a lot of Nebraska producers use this. They may not make decisions on their weed control, but they use this book uh, to check, you know, uh, whether they should go with this product or that product. And information in this book comes from our research. We don't read the label. We don't sell the chemicals, guys. You listen to all these commercials on the, on the radio, and of course, they're going to tell you that their product works the best. There's a lot of good products out there, and some are better than others. And we think that our, our book is a non-biased. We actually received an award from the American Society of Agronomy as one of the, the best uh, extension publication in the United States a few years back. So anyway, we're very proud. We're very proud of this book. and. Uh, so let me walk you into a common uh, uh, water hemp. I'm sure you guys all know what this weed is. Uh, in, in weed science arena now, uh, we have problems with all these weed species, especially with water hemp. Uh, with water hemp. And uh, uh, here's the field uh, where we actually done uh, a bunch of uh, field days and field tours in Fremont, Nebraska, uh, which is uh, kind of north of, north of Lincoln, uh, straight north of Lincoln, about 45 minutes or an hour. And uh, this is the farmer, uh, you can see there, uh, uh, when he harvested this field, uh, he had like a, I think he got like a 32 bushels of soya beans and about 40 bushels of water hemp. <laughs> so you get the picture, and you know what's the really sad story about this field? After he harvested this field, he went across, used the same combine, and uh, was harvesting uh, other fields that didn't have as many water hemp or some other weeds, or now his whole farm has water hemp all over. So basically, with his combine, he was reseeding that water hemp all over the place. So there is one of the methods. I know this is easier for us to talk about around the kitchen table or at the university, you know. But in the practical terms, how often we really clean our machines, uh, clean our machines, you know. And I, actually, I just came back last week. I didn't want to really come back to the mainland of U.S. I was down in Puerto Rico, uh, the uh, National Weed Science Society meeting. And uh, the colleagues, uh, this is uh, like obviously from the whole country. Uh, so the colleagues from uh, southern part of the US, from the cotton country, you know, they're actually talking about the rental rates being set uh, 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 based on the how much resistant weeds you have on your farm. So it's, it's becoming, uh, it's becoming uh, a little bit scary. Uh, we have water hemp uh, pretty much across the whole eastern part. Uh, these maps are uh, maybe a little bit out of date. Out of date. We we stopped even putting any stars uh, any stars on uh, across the uh, across to these maps because they're all over the place. Uh, I'm sure you guys have issues here with water hemp as well. Uh, the one thing that what we are finding out, folks, is if I go back to this slide here, as you can see, we have water hemp that has resistance to uh, about five different modes of actions here. And when the, uh, the atrazine, we've been using atrazine for, and triazines for, uh, for a long, long time. When we started getting resistance in the 80s uh, to, uh, to atrazine or triazine type chemistries, uh, that didn't last for long because we started getting uh, ALS-based ALS products, things like Raptor, Scepter, Pursuit. And then we were just killing all the triazine resistant weeds. We kind of forgot about them. And then after using ALS chemistries for about four or five years, you guys remember, I see a lot of gray hair in the room here. You know, Pursuit used to be a king of weed control in soybeans. After using Pursuit for about five years, things started, poof, that's exactly what it says, sir. Yes, you're right. Things happen, you know. And, you know, we stopped using Pursuit, and actually then the Roundup Ready came on board, and then we... We uh, were killing all the triazine resistant weeds. We were killing all the pursuit resistant weeds around the, around the work beautifully. I'll tell you my estimate in Nebraska right now, based on my uh, discussions with people, Roundup still works well on about half of the farm. 50% of the farm still works well. In fact, some of the meetings that I go and I ask the guys, all right, tell me how many of you are still just planting your soya beans and not using any soil applied herbicides. You just go in and uh, let the weeds come up, let the soybeans come up, and you'll spray a couple, three times Roundup, and about half of the hands go up. So anyway, so I know it still works well at about half of the farms. It's beginning to fall apart on about 20, 25% of the farm, and the other 25% of the farm people have a problem. And those guys that have a problem, uh, they are using soil applied herbicides and they're spending 
you know, uh, 50 bucks, 60 bucks. Some guys are spending 100 bucks. And if they have a multiple resistant water hemp, which means water hemp that has in it all these different resistance, and I'll touch up on that, those guys are spending over $100 an acre and they're still not killing it. So anyway, so let's go back to, uh, uh, let's go back to, uh, to this slide. Basically now, since the Roundup is failing to control water hemp, we go back and we throw in just about anything, anything that you can find in our weed guide. And then uh, we're finding that actually the ALS resistant is still present there and the triazine resistant is still present in those water hemp. So now we have a triple stack. And I'm using that term purposely because you guys can relate. The industry is selling you all these seeds with multi-stacks on it. Oh, well, now we have a water hemp that's a triple stack. The mother nature gives you that for free. There's no tech fee on it. <laughs> so anyway, and uh, you know, so maybe we should take that sign as that we're doing something wrong, guys, out there, because there's no such thing as a free triple stack. So, so what we are finding is that in those populations, not all of them, but in many of them, we'll still have ALS resistance present, and we still have a triazine resistance present. So what does that really mean? It means that once you have this resistance in, in those populations, you own those resistance types as long as you have seeds in your uh, wheat seeds of that population in your farm. You know, there was some documented cases where the triazine resistance might be uh, diluted over years. ALS is not diluted. So keep that in mind, guys, that once you get the resistance in your farm, it just stays there forever. And the way I explain that is, I use this as a joke, and it works most of the time. I hope it's going to work here. I say, uh, you know, if you have a blue eyes, and your wife has a blue eyes, and you have a beautiful kid with the dark eyes, maybe you need to worry about it. <laughs> you know? So anyway, maybe that gene came from the grandpa. You never know. Maybe it came from the grandpa back in the family. But what I'm trying to tell you is some of these uh, genes are being carried from generation to generation. You know? So that's why we don't want to have uh, much of those resistant weeds. Like I said, I'm not going to spend too much time uh, you know, on which herbicides should we use if we, ha if we cannot kill a water hemp with glyphosate, we still have a lot of good herbicides to take care of, uh, of that glyphosate resistant water hemp. Here's the list of the stuff that works real well out of our weed guide that we tested. You have the ratings there, and you guys are familiar with most of these products here. So like I said, I'm not going to spend too much time on individual, uh, individual uh, uh, products here too. And then another thing, you know, we're beginning, we're living, we're not beginning, we are living way into the world where you gotta be politically correct, unless you're running for a president of the United States, then that's a whole different story. You can say whatever you want. But I've been told before, and I, uh, I got in some hot water by saying, you know, openly in front of everybody, this product is better than that product. Oh, the company from that product ended up complaining, why am I bashing their product? So, so I try to avoid saying, go and use this product versus that product. What I do as a public weed scientist, I throw all these products in my plots, I test them, and I publish the data like this, and I say, you guys go out into our weed guide, and you pick whichever product you want, and you just watch, make sure to use the products that I gave the numbers 8, 9, and 10. So that's another reason why I'm trying to avoid uh, you know, picking uh, on this company versus, versus that company. Because believe me, you know, I, I've been in hot water more than once, and I've been doing this for almost 20 years. So anyway, uh, pre and post, we have a lot of, uh, a lot of good, uh, good combinations. You can see here uh, a lot of 2,4-D Hornet distinct status, uh, hormonal chemistries. Uh, you know, you put something down pre, you knock the population. If some of them survive or if they come through, you know, we can take care of them later. I understand that a lot of these things cost money. You know, we go, I go on these meetings all over and, you know, Roundup is still the cheapest. And I understand why people use Roundup. You, you know, you guys have bills to pay like anybody else. And, uh, and it's really hard to beat a $10 an acre uh, weed control program if Roundup works versus you know, uh, 40, 50, 60, or in some cases might be, uh, might be even more. But the bottom line is that we still have uh, uh, chemistries out there that we can get on the, top, on the top of the game. This is in soybeans, again, using a bunch of pre's versus post. And like I said, you guys do have table with all these chemicals, so I'm not going to spend some time on it 
because like I said, I want to give you a really big picture what may or may not happen down the road. And the introduction of some of these new uh, GMO crops are uh, going to help a little bit. They're not going to solve the problems, and I'll tell you why I'm saying that. So anyway, another species here is a giant ragweed. How much of that do you guys, you guys should have some giant ragweed around here, don't you? Some hands here, yes or no? Yeah, a lot of that, you know, it's up in Minnesota's, up in Minnesota's. So uh, in eastern Nebraska, we have it, as you can see these maps. Sorry, I don't have maps of South Dakota, but I, hey, if we have it in Nebraska, you guys should, uh, should, uh, should have it. So we've done some tests. This is like going six years ago, uh, some of my colleagues and, and myself, and this is the resistance level. These are different counties. These are different counties in Nebraska. You can see the resistance level there. Those yellow letters are saying 11x, uh, 5x uh, resistance. 11x, that means if the label rate says 22 ounces of weather power max, I got to use 240 ounces to kill that weed. You know, is that resistance? That is resistant. You know, so anyway, we have some 3x resistance. It just depends. Those are the, but look at the year. That was in 2006. That was five years ago. You know, five years ago. Here is what some of those plants look like. Look at this. Uh, these plants survive 176 ounces of Roundup. These plants here, this guy survived 352 ounces of Roundup, guys. I mean, 352 ounces. I might as well drop the jug on it and see if that's going to kill it. You know, so this is, this is uh, look at how these plants uh, are regrowing. So the key on some of these uh, uh, glyphosate-resistant weeds, and I'm going to show you a video here uh, 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 pretty soon is basically the way, uh, am I going too loud now? A little bit, maybe I got fired up now, so. <laughs> it's like, a, I, like, I like diesel engines, you know, diesel engines when they warm up, they just keep going, you know. So anyway, so I'm like an old, uh, old diesel engine. Uh, basically, you'll spray Roundup and you will see the leaf tissue, the leaf tissue, whether it's in water hemp, whether it's in Marysdale, I'll show you some pictures of Marysdale, whether is it, uh, uh, you know, uh, this uh, giant ragweed or common ragweed, the leaves will turn brown within 10 days. It almost looks like they're burning. You know, glyphosate is a systemic chemical. It doesn't burn the leaves. Glyphosate gets inside the plant, shuts down the uh, shikimic acid pathway, which is a pathway needed for ALS production, the, uh, the amino acid production. So the symptoms of uh, glyphosate uh, injury are, you can see on this slide here, the yellowing of the tips, because that's the youngest tissue of the plant. And when you shut down the protein production, the part of the plant that needs most food are the young tissue that needs growth. And that's where you see yellowing. So those are the typical symptoms of Roundup killing a plant. But that's not the case anymore in the resistant species. In the resistant species, Roundup burns the leaves. Look at this, how they, they burn the leaves, although this is 21 days after treatment. That's what DAT stands for. It burns the leaves. So you might be out there, you know, uh, two weeks, even three weeks after spraying, and your weed is dead, and you may think, okay, I'm done now. I can go fishing or whatever. But wait a minute. You want to go back, guys, now. So after spraying all of your chemicals, two or three weeks ratings or checking those fields doesn't really count anymore if you're beginning to have some problems with, uh, with the Roundup resistant weeds. You want to go back and look for these things. Look how they're regrowing. They are coming back. Like I said, look at this guy survived 352 ounces. That's a 16x label rate uh, of, uh, of Roundup. Okay, I would say we learn things from this in the big scheme of things. It's not a big deal because it's a single resistance. It's a single type of resistance, single stack of resistance. We do have, look at all these herbicides will kill that giant ragweed. Uh, pre, those are uh, products that we tested. Uh, and then pre and post, we have similar products like in the previous. A lot of these uh, tables may look alike because those are the list. If you see the list of these herbicides here, they're all listed alphabetically. Why they're listed alphabetically? Because what I do is I open the Nebraska Weed Guide and we have a herbicides efficacy tables in here for every crop, for every crop, and then all the products that we think that work well. We're not Walmart, University of Nebraska, this Weed Guide is not a Walmart. We don't sell everything to everybody, you know. 
You guys have some retailers in this state. I don't want to mention their names, but we don't work like that. We put the stuff that we know they work well, and we give the numbers and the ratings for it. That's why everything is, everything is uh, uh, in alphabetical order. And out of these 30 products that I have here, I'm actually showing only 12 because those 12 work well for this particular weed. There might be another 12 that work for another weed. You go across here, you'll find about 20 different weed species. Weed species. Like I said, if you think I'm putting a plug for Nebraska Weed Guide, of course I am. Of course I am, because we're proud of this book, and this is the best $15. I mean, what do you get for 15 bucks anymore? You can buy a three beer or four beer, unless you buy uh, cheap ones, might be more. You know, so this is the best 15 bucks you guys can spend. And uh, so that's the, uh, we do have all kinds of products for ragweed, pre and post in soybeans, same story. Uh, this is some post alone. You know, if you, uh, if you don't want to spend uh, money on pre's, on pre's and post. Okay, here's the mare's tail. Mare's tail, I, I do a lot of uh, weed control and rangeland and pasture. See, you, I'm sure you guys all remember Leon when he was a weed specialist in your state. I love Leon, we were good friends. I used to come to South Dakota a lot. You know, uh, he and I would put uh, programs uh, together. And, uh, and anyway, the Leon retired. Le Leon retired. And that kind of put me uh, to the wayside. But then I started doing some other stuff. Anyway, the, uh, the mare's tail is a rangeland and pasture weed. And I used to come in, in South Dakota and talk about some range and pasture weed control and purple loose strife and phragmites and all those things. Anyway, so this weed used to be along the roadsides and ditches and behind the grain bins and waste areas and so forth. It was never really an issue in, uh, in uh, field crops, hunters, we started doing a couple of things. Number one is a no-till. I know you guys are all no-tillers. Don't shoot me. I'm not going to say anything against no-till. You know, uh, uh, there are actually cases where I tell the guys, if we don't have a chemical, maybe you need to get that blade out and maybe just this, that part of the field. And in particular, I'm talking about a weed species like a scouring rush. Scouring rush is in the wet wet areas of the farm. Does anybody of you have a problem with scouring rush? Maybe a little bit? Yeah, we have no chemical to kill scouring rush. Believe me, guys, in my Nebraska weed guide, I have a lot of chemicals that we tried, and I couldn't kill scouring rush with anything. So what I tell the guys in Nebraska, you know, it's usually along the edges, creeps in from the ditch, because that's where the wet spots are. Go in with the disc, and maybe this, just a little area, in the spring and in the fall. And you do that for a couple, three years, and that will, uh, that will set it back for sure. You know, so that's where Mary's tail, you know, exploded because of the no-till and because of the repeated use of Roundup, Roundup and a lack of soil-applied herbicides. Lack of soil-applied herbicide is actually probably a number one reason, although I gave you three, but that might be the number one reason why is the Mary's tail is becoming a problem because we don't use soil applied herbicides. You look at the biology, biology of this weed species, it will germinate in the fall or in the early spring. And by the time we go on to plant our beans or corn, that thing is already a couple, three feet tall. You want to spray it with the chemicals. Roundup worked well you know, uh, uh, for a while. And in the 2001 was the first case of glyphosate resistant Mary's tail in the United States. It was up in Delaware and in Nebraska, you know, where we, uh, we had that case confirmed in 2006. In 2006, so you can see the, the resistance levels, you know, from 1 to 6x X, X resistance levels. As you can see, it's all over, all over the state. The key in controlling this weed is you want to spray it at the seedling stage or a rosette stage. If you let it develop a stem, you better make sure to catch that stem before it gets to be about half a foot tall or so. And that's all easier said than done. It's really tricky, guys. So basically, what I'm going to do right now, uh, I'm going to show you a video. And I'm actually going to go, I'm actually going to go with my old way. Um, oops, hold on. No. Uh, I can see the video here, but you guys cannot see it there. So that means that my technology is not working well. Okay, how do I escape? Thank you. And I'm going to minimize this. All right, this is Mary's tail sprayed with uh, Roundup, and it shows its growth uh, for about four weeks of the season. And you can see 
day by day, this is time-lapse photography that I use in my research now uh, more and more, so we can actually document how some of these weeds, so there's now uh, uh, day 8 to 14, and uh, notice how the bottom of the plants are, uh, are turning brown. Look how the weeds around there are turning brown. And the, uh, see the tip of the plant, how it is actually continuing to grow. This is now day 15 to 21. Uh, you see how that tip just continues growing, continues growing. So this is our Roundup resistant Maristale, guys, you know. And uh, I have similar videos on some other species, but this is the one that I thought uh, it's probably enough to illustrate the point. Look at day 22 to 28. Look how that guy, that guy just keeps on growing. The bottom part, uh, the leaves were burned off and everything, but obviously the plant inside is still alive and it just keeps, uh, keeps moving and, and growing. In weed science, we have a term. We say, wow, we pissed it off so it grows better. You know, I, I apologize for saying it like that, but you guys understand what I'm trying to say here. But the, uh, okay, so let's go back to my, uh, let's see. Okay, so we'll skip that. In terms of, do we have herbicides to kill Mary's tail? Yes, we do, guys. Yes, we do. But we got to catch them when they're small. That's the key. That's the key. I get phone calls in July. They said, hey, we sprayed Maristale with all kinds of stuff there, and then now it's like a three foot and we cannot kill it. I said, guys, too late. You missed the boat, uh, whatever the expression is, missed the train. So if you want to burn it when it's in a rosette stage, we have all kinds of herbicides. You have all this in my, uh, NEPGA, in my uh, handout, so I'm not going to spend uh, too, much, uh, too much time, uh, like I said, on individual on any of these. In the weed guide, we have a list of products for the fall burn down, for the spring burn down, for pre, post. The key is, like I said, catch them guys when they are small. If you let them grow to be uh, more than a foot tall, uh, a lot of these products will say on the label six, uh, six inches, we're going to have a, you know, you're going to have a problem killing it. Uh, we were actually looking at some of the foot tall uh, uh, Mary's tail with the uh, 2,4-D and with clarity. And the reason why I'm showing those two because the Dicamba bean is going to be coming on the market and List Duo will be coming on the market. I'll talk about that quite a bit yet, uh, quite a bit yet. Uh, how am I doing with time? Okay, I have what, about 30, 30 minutes? You took my minutes with your jokes and all that stuff, so <laughs> I'm not going to give him that. You see, we work in extension. When they give us half an hour, we say, no, give me an hour. When they give me an hour, I said, no, I need two hours. So anyway. Uh, this is in beans, uh, you know, uh, it's much harder to control Maristale in beans than in, uh, and, and then in, in corn, especially if you want to go with the post-emerge uh, products later on. You don't have as many uh, products. This is a spring burn down, and as you can see, they're pre a few and some uh, first rate or reflex flex style will going to knock them off a little bit, but if it gets too big, it's not going to kill them completely. Okay. Uh, Mary's tail in soybeans, like I said, you have all that in the handouts. Palmer amaranth is another one of the species in Nebraska. It's beginning to show uh, in the uh, uh, south of uh, Interstate uh, uh, 80, and uh, we're having some pockets in the northern part, northern part of the state. So that's the one you guys wanna, you're gonna watch, uh, you wanna watch for. We also have a 2,4-D resistant water hemp. So, uh, so that's in the uh, the southeastern part of, of Nebraska. And uh, so, but let me, let me actually tell you, this is actually, if you want to remember only one thing from this whole presentation, guys, this is what I really want to hit you with, guys. This is what I really want you to take home is individual cases of glyphosate resistant weeds right now, I don't see as a big problem because we do have uh, good herbicides to control them. But this is, guys, what the problem is or may be out there, because we already have cases. Are these what I call triple stacks? In Nebraska, I have glyphosate, ALS, and atrazine resistant water hemp, and or atrazine, ALS, and HPPD. HPPD, those are the Callisto, Lotus, Impact, uh, Balance Flex, those types of chemicals. But look at this, guys. We have a five stack water hemp in the United States. In Illinois, we have a single water hemp plant that has a natural resistance. It developed a resistance to five of those modes of actions, guys. 
Isn't that amazing what these weeds are? You know, and uh, look at this, triazine, ALS, HPPD, PPO, uh, that's like uh, Sharpen, those types of chemistries, uh, PPO, 2,4-D, that's a five-way stack. That takes five modes of actions out of the window from your toolbox. It's gone forever. You know, in Missouri, they have a, and they don't have glyphosate in this one here yet. It's just a matter of time. Uh, glyphosate, triazine, LS, HPP, and PPO in Missouri. Why are we worried about it? Because the industry put a lot of their money and effort into biotech. There are companies working now 24-7 trying to come up with the new active ingredients, active ingredients, but it's getting harder and harder to, uh, to do that. It costs, they talk about, I don't know, 200, 300 million, 400 million, it doesn't really matter, you know, uh, is it that number or this number, it takes much more to develop a new, uh, to come up with the new active ingredients, even with all the, bio, all the, uh, the high, uh, high computers out there and the chemical engineers and everything, it's just getting harder and harder to come up with the, with the new active. And then also the governments are having tougher and tougher regulations about registering all these new chemicals. So it's just harder and harder to come up with the new actives as opposed to putting a gene into this variety or that variety, you know, which is, which is like a, a literally a small, small percent uh, and that's of the overall cost of development. That's why at all our industry is going into, uh, into GMO crops. So what is going to be out on the market, guys? Uh, we're going to see the Canva beans. Uh, apparently, uh, the Chinese approved it. Uh, uh, Europeans, they're waiting for European approval yet. And I was told that once that is approved, uh, the uh, EPA is going to approve it here. Uh, they, they, uh, uh, the, the, the products that you'll be using in the Canva, in the Canva beans, uh, it's going to be, uh, they're going to be advertising uh, Monsanto's form of the Canva, which is going to be called Extend or Extend Max. And then uh, BSF has a, a compound, uh, it's their form of the Canva, it's going to be called Ingenia. And uh, so those two will be primarily advertised. Some people are going to try to probably cheat the system a little bit for lack of a better term. If you want to do that, uh, we better watch out what kind of the Canva you're using out there because you might be killing those beans and I'll show you some pictures here. You know, uh, you might be, uh, you should be able to get away with clarity. Maybe I shouldn't have told you that, but sometimes I, I tell people when they call me over the phone which ones they can get away with or not. The Dow Agro is coming up in Enlist Duo, which is a, we do have a 2,4-D amine and ester formulations. You guys know those, they've been around for a, little, a long time. Now they have this new choline, which more or less has the same activity and everything, but it's a little bit less volatile. And the way they're going to be uh, marketing that, it's going to be uh, stacked with uh, Roundup, with glyphosate. That's why they call it a duo. And, uh, you know, uh, the Enlist Duo is registered. The EPA put a plug for about three months this winter, and it looks like they lifted that now. So, so it looks like that Enlist Duo will be sold. The chemical, or the herbicides will be sold about the seed. I don't know yet, so that's why I put a question mark there. Balance GT is, the, uh, is the, 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 another GMO crop that's going to come out by Bayer. It's going to be uh, tolerant to... Uh, Isoxaflutol, which is the active inside the Balance Flex. And uh, so basically, Balance Flex, you guys have been using in corn pre emerge or early post. And uh, now, uh, you know, in a few years, you might be able to spray that right on the top of your beans. You know, and the same idea with the, uh, the Syngenta is coming up with the uh, Mesotrion uh, resistant or Callisto uh, HPPD soybeans. Soybeans. But I don't know how much that's going to change. You guys heard that uh, Chem China. Uh, is, is in the process of buying Syngenta or the news is saying that it, it's a done deal, they're working on paperwork now, so I don't want to be quoted on this. Uh, looks like the Chinese are going to own, own uh, uh, Syngenta now. And then uh, the, the Pioneer DuPont has uh, both soybeans, which is the glyphosate ALS resistant soybeans. So I work with all these, all these uh, compounds. Uh, this is a Dicamba tolerant uh, soybean program you know, that the university will be recommending, you know, uh, if you guys are going to go out and start using that Dicamba pre and post and post for the second time, we're going to drive that Dicamba into ground because we already have Dicamba resistant weeds out there. Just go to your western part of the state, down into Nebraska, uh, Wyoming, uh, uh, Colorado, there is Dicamba resistant kochia out there. So, but if you use 
something pre and you come back with that dicamba and your dicamba beans, then that will last, uh, last much longer. Uh, the, uh, the one thing that I wanted to show you is you're going to watch, and I'm sure at the beginning it's going to be issues out there, those chemicals drifting, drifting away. Or, uh, or uh, here's, the, uh, here's the deal uh, where we sprayed Ingenia, which is the form of the Camba that uh, BSF is going to sell. And then we compare that on the beans uh, uh, with the status. Status is a diflofenzapir plus the Camba, so it does have a Camba in it. And then we use the 2,4-D uh, there. We wanted to see what's the, what's the, uh, the crop tolerance, what's the crop, uh, the Camba soybean tolerance to some of the other uh, what we call the hormonal type chemistries, hormonal type chemistries, and but it looks like uh, you know uh, that it's not good, so you have to stick with the product that they recommend. And I'll give you an example. This all seems to me actually. Let me show you the pictures. Basically, uh, here's the Ingenia. If you spray Ingenia on the Camba beans, uh, this is what they're going to look like. They will be okay. But if you spray Status or 2,4-D, you're going to kill them or you're going to have this, you know. Anyway, and uh, also another issue is going to be there. Um, the uh, tank con contamination, uh, the, the leftovers of the products. I already have dealers down in Nebraska who are saying, oh, with this hits the market, we're going to get a floater and a sprayer just for the Camba beans and a floater and a sprayer just for 2,4-D and list beans. Because if we start mixing these things, here's what we've done is we were looking at the contamination rates. If you have a 1 over 100 of the label rate, and the label rate, uh, I'll show you some pictures here, is going to be uh, like for the camp, it's going to be about 12.8, about 13 ounces. So if you have a 0.1 ounce left in your tank, you know, uh, that's going to be a problem. And also we, sh we went as low as a 1,000th of the label rate. Label rate. So here is the... Uh, here is the, in, in my study there, there's a strip here where we sprayed with the one hundreds of the label rate. And uh, you can see all the cupping, all the cupping on the leaves and everything. There was no yield reduction in this particular. But then uh, they, we've done these studies in a bunch of different locations across the United States. And there were sites where the soybeans variety was so sensitive to this that actually they had three to five bushels yield reduction yield reduction because of the one hundreds of the label rate contamination. And even if you go one thousands of the label rate uh, contamination out there, you'll still have a little bit of copying is going to show there. So this is, I'm just telling you guys how uh, some of that stuff, uh, it's going to get real tricky, real tricky when you start seeing those crops. Bolt beans, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Uh, these are different programs. This is not going to see the market for another three years or, uh, or uh, who knows. So to be on a positive note, guys, I'm, I didn't come here to scare you or anything. I came here to paint you the picture. Maybe that's my picture the way I see it. Uh, maybe not. You know, we still have a lot of good products out there. A lot of good products. What I gave you there is this uh, chart of cytomotive actions. Cytomotive actions uh, that's in the... Uh, uh, you can download those from the website too. The group is called Take Action at Weeds, which is about 20 or so weed scientists that talk the way I talk about these things. And we develop these charts to help you uh, uh, learn some of the uh, mode of actions of this numbering, numbering system. And you'll hear more and more people talk about mode of actions versus site of action. So the mode of action is basically uh, how the weed dies and the site of action is where in the plant all this, uh, this is uh, uh, occurring. So here's the question I'm going to ask you. Do you guys have any idea how many herbicide products are registered in your state of South Dakota? I know exactly how many are in Nebraska because I'm the senior editor of the Weed Guide and I'll give you those numbers on the next slide. But do you guys know how many products are registered for weed control in South Dakota? Give me some numbers. 100, 200, 500, 2,000, 100, okay. 200, okay, keep going. Higher? 800, yeah, seven. Who said seven? These guys from Yankton County are smart, huh? <laughs> the, uh, or who knows, maybe he's seen some of my talks, you know. Okay, so here it is. In Nebraska, and like I said, Nebraska, South Dakota, these products are all more or less registered in both states. We have over 700 registered, but here's the catch. People say, 700, why do I worry about if a Roundup doesn't kill my weeds? But here's the catch, guys. There's always a catch out there. Don't you know that? You know, 
we have, out of those 700 products, we have 99 active ingredients, we have 20 families, we have 18 sites of action, and we have only 10 modes of action. We have actually only eight modes of action that we use for weed control in our agronomic crops. If I broke even this down by number, you have all this in the handouts, 250 in corn, 2 in soybeans, 40 in 140, 120 in sorghum and wheat, pasture, 220, vegetable, sugar beets, aquatic, lawn, turf, blah, 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 220. Look at this. We have glyphosate-based products. We've got 83 of them. Dicamba, we've got 69. We have 87 2,4-D-based products. We have 69 uh, uh, dicamba-based products, but you cannot use all of them in your dicamba beans because you better watch out unless you want to kill those, uh, those beans. So, but let me go back so, uh, to that. Uh, multi-stack. So can you imagine now if you have a five-stack water hemp in your field and you want to kill it and actually, and Steve is telling you, oh, you actually have only eight modes of action. So basically you just have three modes of actions left out there, left out there that can help you. So this is the, uh, what I'm talking about, uh, the, the efficacy tables, uh, you know, Nebraska, go to unlmarketplace.com. Uh, Ray, did I market this enough here now? Okay, thank you, sir. Make sure you bring it later on, too. Ray is from Nebraska, too, you know, so. Anyway, and uh, we already sold about 10,000 copies of the book, so, you know, it's not like, but I'm trying to promote it everywhere we go. And so on the beginning of all of my tables, in all of our tables for efficacy, as you can see, different weed species, different chemicals, we added this column that's called site of action numbering system, which refers to what is in this chart. So when you look at the weed control, and if you see there that, uh, for example, you know, I have a glyphosate uh, resistant meristale here, and then you go down the list and all the glyphosates here, I'm giving low numbers. If it's glyphosate alone, I'm giving number four or five, as you can see here that I'm pointing. You know, then you want to look for some other chemicals that don't have a number nine, because number nine is a group uh, mode of action for Roundup. It's a shikimic acid or LS, uh, LS uh, uh, acid uh, formation or protein production. So basically, you look at those numbers before you decide whether you want to use a product A or product, product B. And basically what that means is like, I'm just giving a hypothetical scenario. Uh, you know, uh, let's say in your corn, if you, we have a seven mode of actions that we could use over a four year period. You know, this is some chemicals that you can use pre and post and these are their site of action. Group 27, group 25 and group four. So a lot of these groups, guys, this is the only way we're gonna slow down the resistance, guys. If we don't take this seriously, you know, we're gonna have a problem. I've been one of the black sheeps in the weed science world. From day one, I was telling people, we're gonna have a problem with Roundup Ready technology, guys. I love that uh, uh, product of Roundup. Glyphosate is a one in a hundred year discovery. My generation will, I don't think they'll ever come up with a good chemical as, as Roundup. I hope I'm wrong. But, you know, I said, if we're gonna be using all these acres of corn, 80 million acres of corn, 80 million acres of soya beans, how many million acres of cotton, and we use Roundup, three times a, day, a year for how many years? And we think that's gonna last forever? Come on guys, give me a break. You know, and I was telling people that a lot of crop consultants told me, Steve, we never really took you seriously in the beginning, you know, and then now when that thing starts falling apart, they're beginning to listen more and more, but they don't really listen to us unless they have a problem. You know, unfortunately, that's how it works. So you guys, this is gonna be the only way to slow down the resistance that we have across the, across the, uh, the country. And we better pay attention to some of these numbers. I actually teach a, a workshop on a resistance where I talk about these things for a whole day. I'll show you a slide that we're doing it in March in four locations across the country. So we do have products for corn and products for soybeans. So again, I'll, I'm gonna tell you why I'm cons really concerned about it, guys. And if you didn't get my point now, you will get it from the series of slides that I'm gonna show you now. Here's the table that we're gonna fill out. Look at this here. This is a site of action nine. It's a glyphosate resistant water hemp. I wanna kill it in corn pre-emerge. So if I have a glyphosate resistant water hemp in my corn, I wanna kill it in corn pre-emerge. Obviously I'm not gonna use Roundup because Roundup doesn't have soil activity. So I do have all kinds of products out there that I, I can kill that glyphosate resistant water hemp. Like I said, the products are there. If it's a triazine resistant, yeah, I still have a lot of products that I can do it. If it's ALS resistant, yeah, I have a lot of products that I can do it. And, and if it's HPPD, which is the one like a Callisto, Lotus, uh, uh, Escort, you know, those types of chemistries, you know, 
I still have a bunch of herbicides to kill it, as you can see, sad places. Here's the catch now. What about if I have a multi-stack water hemp on my farm? How many options do I have there? The options are getting limited. The options are getting limited. Basically, what is left out there, and this is pre-emerge, guys, soil applied, you know, it's PPOs. So if it's PPO, and there is already PPO resistance down south. So we guys from the north here, hopefully we can learn something from the guys down south, you know, because they have that PPO. See, they had these problems earlier, so they started using more of the other, other products, and now they started getting resistance to those too. For some reason, you know, every time the industry comes up with a new herbicide, you know, of course it's going to work well. And for some reason, people fall in love with it, and they want to use it every year. And then, and which was the case with Roundup. But if we keep doing that for so many years, it's just a matter of time because things are going to start falling, falling apart. Let's go back to my table. If it's PPO only, I still have a lot of products. But I already have a five-way stack. This five-way stack in Missouri, I don't have any products to kill it. That's why I said, guys, I know it costs money. Every, you know, I go and do these meetings and I tell you, listen, guys, you guys are smart. You've been doing this for so long. I'm not going to tell you anything new. I'm just going to tell you, go and farm the way you farmed 20 years ago. Put some soil apply down and put some post-emerge. Uh, post and you can grow GMO crops, but limit application of those chemicals to only one shot per year. And if we've been doing that, if we've been doing that, we wouldn't have a problem. And so everything that I'm telling you here is going to cost you money. I understand that. I understand that. And, uh, but I want you to know that some of these things, if we keep doing the way we're doing, we're going to have a, we're going to have a problem. Post-emerging corn, same story. Look at this. We can go down the list. Glyphosate, no problem. Triazines, no problem. ALS, no problem. HPPD, yeah, there's some issues. If it's a four-way stack, we have only a couple of options. If we get a hormone site, that's a, a site of action group four, which is that enlist duo, we already have a 2,4-D resistant water hemp in Nebraska. And, uh, and then uh, if we start getting that on the top of the previous four, we're running out of chemicals. And your no-till system, guys, it's not going to work. You may have to uh, get some of those blades. Or I do a lot of research on weed control with propane flaming. Maybe we can help you with something there, too. I'm joking, but I'm half serious too, guys. Anyway, soybean, same story. Look at this. I can go on and on telling you what are some of the issues that we have. Like I said, you guys have all this. So now you know if you look into my handouts and you see all these sad faces, checkoffs, and all that, that's basically what that is. Uh, soybean post-emerge, post-emerge, the same, the same deal. This is what I'm afraid of. I'm afraid of these multi-stacks. We're still far away from those. We're still far away, you know, but you want to keep an eye on what's going, what's going on on your farm and, and spray and go back and, and check. So where do we go from here? Did I scare you enough? That was not intention at all, you know, and uh, this is what I call the 10, uh, 10 commandments, uh, 10 commandments uh, of, uh, of, of weed control. Like I said, the new GMO crops that are coming on the market, watch out how you use those guys. If you're going to be using the Camba, you can get residual activity from the Camba, but you've got to put a lot of it out there. You may get a couple of three uh, weeks of residual activity if you put a, a pint or even a whole quart of the Camba, uh, and you'll get a residual activity, and then you can come back, and if you spray the Camba again and again, and you do that for about four or five years, we're going to have a problem. So, so that's what I say. Rotate. Rotate, rotate modes of actions. The one thing that worries me is like when these companies start coming up with all these new traits, they might be selling those traits to each other. So we may have actually a soya bean that has a Roundup Ready, Liberty Link, the Canva, uh, and List, and HPP. There might be a five-way stack, and then that would be a nightmare to kill as a volunteer next year in your soya bean, in your corn. Believe me, guys. So anyway, use the full rates. Don't cut the rates. Scout the fields. Like I said, look for those survivors out there. You know, uh, I know you're not going to like when I say tillage. Cover crops, we work with cover crops. There is more of that. I know the benefits of cover crops as long as they don't behave as weeds. Uh, no problem with that. Borders, uh, clean equipment, and know the cost of or poor control. So I'm pretty much, pretty much done here. The, uh, 
Uh, this is a plug for our workshop. For our workshop, uh, we're going to have a March 7 in Wayne, Nebraska, 8th and Clay Center, which is way south uh, and uh, uh, west of Lincoln. And then we're going to do one in Grant, uh, uh, which is in southwestern part of, of Nebraska. Uh, from North Platte, you go south and west, and then in Scotts Bluff, which is way over in the Panhandle part, Panhandle part of the state. So believe it or not, I actually did it on time. I actually something else here I was going to show you very quickly. Let me. This is going to take just a one minute. This is a preliminary data. I didn't know if I was going to have time or not to show you uh, what happened with those soybeans. You plant your soybeans, and if you don't use any soil applied, if you don't use any soil applied herbicides, soil applied herbicide, this is what we call the time of removal weed studies. I've done a lot of those with a critical period of weed control. Basically, uh, if you plant your beans and uh, you wait for the weeds to come up, you wait for the crop to come up, and then you go in and do a shot, shot of Roundup, this is basically, if you let those weeds stay up to a uh, first shred foliate, this is the red line without soil applied herbicides, you'll have about, you know, maybe a close to 5% yield loss. If you let it stay till a third trifoliate, you may have 10%. If you go uh, up to a sixth trifoliate or beginning flowering, it might be 20 some percent. And this is the line that if you put down some soil applied herbicides, long story short, if you put down a soil applied herbicide in your soybeans, uh, without, within your soybeans, uh, you can wait for about almost a V4 or V5 stage before you go in to do the first shot of Roundup. But you gotta put something down pre to keep the weeds, weeds down. And if you don't have any, any uh, soil applied products, you gotta go in another first, second trifoliate to, uh, to spray that Roundup and kill the weeds. And that translates into uh, about 21 days versus 41 days. So by doing, by using a soil applied herbicide, uh, you're basically, uh, buying yourself about at least three to four weeks before you go in to do uh, uh, a Roundup application. And uh, I'm actually, this was just a preliminary study we did this year, and I'm going to repeat that, uh, or last year, this year on several locations so I can have a multi-site. And I'm going to talk about this from the standpoint that with this, we're going to also help with the uh, weed, uh, weed resistance issue because uh, we're going to be using different modes of actions for for uh, uh, soil applied, and I think with that I'm going to stop. I probably told you guys more than you wanted to hear, but that's just uh, just the name of the game. Well, that was fantastic information, very timely. Um, okay, I don't know if I'm more scared about all of the resistance or the fact that China's buying up the world. I'm not sure. Uh, 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 turn that camera off, and then I'll tell you. <laughs> 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 uh, we do have some time for some questions. Does anybody have any questions? I'm going to bring the mic around, so if you want to have fun with the fat Norwegian moderator, like ask one up there and one up there, and I'll run right. through. You skipped over Palmer Amherst. Right, uh, right. Uh, talking to the people of western Kansas, very south of Nebraska. Right. Terrible weed to control. Yes. Our question is, my question is, is how do we protect ourselves? That right. Way? Thank you very much. Did you guys hear the question about Palmer Amaranth? I did my PhD in Kansas and I, in uh, 91, 92, 93. That's been a long time ago. And I worked actually on pigweed species. And Kansas has seven different pigweed species. Palmer Amaranth is the most aggressive one of those. Uh, traditionally, that's been a southern weed. It's been Kansas and south of Kansas. Palmer amaranth is a weed species that literally killed, and I apologize for using the term killed, but you guys all know what I'm trying to say here. It literally killed the cotton production in the United States because that is the species that developed resistance to, to uh, uh, Roundup. And Roundup Pretty Cotton uh, was an example where we didn't use any other herbicides in there, so just Roundup. Their growing season is much longer. They were using three, four, five shots of Roundup and worked beautifully for about five, six, seven years until Palmer came in and developed resistance. The plant can grow. We grew Palmer down in uh, Garden City, Kansas. I don't know if you know where Garden City, Kansas is down in a South Central Kansas. Uh, when I was a grad student, we were going to go there the first time I got excited. I think, man, that's going to be a nice town, flowers, blah, blah, blah. You can smell the town 30 miles before you get to it. 
because of all the feedlots, and the local guy says that's the smell of money. I understand that. That's a irrigated, a flood irrigated corn in furrows. And we grew Palmer there looking at the competition between corn and Palmer. And corn in, in those irrigated furrows was growing like a 12 foot high, and Palmer was growing 14 foot higher, high, two, three feet higher. And the base of the plant was as thick as on my arm. As a grad student, you know, I was joking. I said, man, I need a chainsaw to cut this darn thing. So it's an extremely uh, invasive species. And it's creeping north. North Dakota already have it. You guys have it. Michigan has it. And it's been coming in with the custom, uh, with the custom harvesters. We had doc documented cases of custom harvesters. It's been coming in with the hay. They were buying hay from south. And with that, they were getting, uh, they were getting Palmer. And uh, so I don't know if I'm really answering your question. How do you protect yourself from those things? Watch out where you're getting stuff. And if you see some Palmer out there, Palmer, I don't have pictures here. Basically, all of you guys know what a poinsettia Christmas flower looks like. Early in the season, early in the season, you will see a water hemp and you see a Palmer next to each other. And this guy is going to look like a poinsettia leaf arrangement. It's going to have a, like a watermark, like a thumbprint on the leaves. That's your Palmer. You make sure you kill that, you know, because Palmer has a chance to become a new water hemp here in the Midwest because it's slowly creeping, creeping north. As far as the wheat, uh, the chemicals, so far what we've seen in Nebraska, things that still work on water hemp, they work on Palmer. So they're both pigweed species, you know, Palmer, uh, it's called uh, Amaranthus palmeri. So it's a palmer amaranth. The, you know, uh, uh, red root pigweed is Amaranthus retrofraxus. And uh, uh, water hemp is Amaranthus rubis. They're all, they're all coming from the same family. The, uh, or just one more thing here on palmer. Palmer is uh, monoaceous, which means it's got a male and female plants. They're separate. Male and females are separate. Water hemp is the same, male and female. This is the reason. So every time you have hybridization, you have tendency to have children that are better. You know? So every time we see that in weed species, they have tendency to develop resistance. And then the worst part is right now I have a study where I am planting uh, palmer uh, water hemp in the middle of the plots, and I'm planting Palmers down the road going 200 feet in different direction. We call this a gene flow study. So when these plants get to a flowering stage, we have to look and uh, take the males or females. So I'm keeping males of HPPD resistant water hemp in the middle because we have callisto, that's a callistolotus impact uh, uh, balance. We have those that are resistant to those chemicals. That's water hemp. And then down the road, up to about 120 feet in both, uh, uh, both directions, I'm keeping females of Palmer to see if they will hybridize. And they do hybridize. We're finding. Uh, females of Palmer, my student actually, we just came back from the Puerto Rico meeting, I told you that earlier, got the award as the best poster on the conference because we're documenting that those two species can hybridize. So now take this to my slide when I say if I have a five-way stack of water hemp out there and then I get a, a Palmer that might be susceptible through pollination, those genes can move into Palmer and cause a problem down the road. That's why I said, guys, it's critical that we start using some of the other chemicals. Industry tells me, Steve, you're our best salesman of chemicals. I said, guys, I don't sell chemicals. I'm telling you what are the problems we're going to face. So I don't know if I really answer your question, but Palmer is a tough one, guys. And you know, because of that hybridization, I get phone calls uh, down by in your neck of the woods, Ray, where the guy says, we have this funny looking water hemp. We don't even know what it is. I go out there. I said, guys, this is not water hemp. This is not Palmer. It's a hybrid of the two. So you can see how Mother Nature is mutating, for lack of a better term. You know, 
because we're forcing in with what we do. I was, I was, I told several times and people didn't like it. I said, we have the weed species that we deserve because we selected for them. We selected for them. Yes. Are we getting any help from that or not? Yes, we do. Every time, every time you, like in eastern Nebraska, is the camera still on? Yes, okay. In, in eastern Nebraska, what I want to say here is my cropping system is actually really boring. I'm doing corn, soybeans, corn, soybeans. You guys actually across South Dakota, you have more crop. You have more diverse systems than ours. So anytime you can, you can uh, throw in something, what I called, to keep weeds off balance. I teach a class on integrated weed management, which I didn't put a slide here. If you guys want to come to Lincoln on March 1st and 2nd in Lincoln, I'm teaching a two-day workshop on integrated weed management, talking about these things. What can we do with the system to go away from doing the same thing over and over? So if you have a weed stubble, you have other chemistries that you throw in, that will help. Anything will help to go away from using the same thing over and over. I like hunting. I like venison. If my wife was kill, cooking me venison all the time, I don't think I have many options either to buy her another, another, uh, another meat or change the wife. You know, we don't, we don't want to go there. But am I answering your question? Right, the Bactril is like a triazine-based product, and uh, if you didn't have any issue with the triaz with the atrazine-resistant weeds in there, then it will help you. If it works for you, probably you didn't have a, re a triazine-resistant weed. Um, one other question, please. Do you guys have a website? I didn't see it anywhere on the literature, a website to get a hold of this, and I want one of those books. <laughs> yeah, the book, um, I don't have the, uh, uh, I, I probably should have put a slide there. It's called, you go to uh, um, uh, www.unl.mark, no, no, sorry, you go marketplace.unl. Just Google there, UNL Marketplace, Marketplace, and it will get you into uh, our uh, website that sells extension publications. You can buy a hard copy for 15 bucks or you can download a PDF for 15 bucks. A lot of farmers that I know, I give them this book for, for free just because I work with them all the time. Uh, they let me put the plots on their, on their, on their field and all that. So, uh, just to shorten it up, you just Google, like I said, you Google Nebraska Weed Guide. And, it's right. and if you just type in Nebraska Weed Guide, it'll probably just take you up there. Thank you for saying that, sir. Okay, I have to have to be the mean guy and shut us down and keep on track. We'll be around for a while. If you have I'll be here through lunch, you know, that's, that's all. Okay, um, thank you, guys.